I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. This is the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the Disney-themed podcast, the Community Voices partner for NPR Illinois and the Front Row Network. And we are so excited today. It is Hamilton Day here at Beyond the Mouse. We're going to talk a lot about Hamilton with one of the stars of Hamilton. We are so excited to bring this interview to you. But before we do that, we better introduce ourselves. So my name is Craig, and I have with me today my co-hosts. I have Brett Rutherford. Hello. And I got Miss Vanessa Ferguson. How are you? I'm doing great, Craig. I'll tell you what. We just got done with this interview, and it is so much fun. If you are someone that uh, has ever had an interest in musical theater, this is going to be a conversation that I think you're really going to enjoy. We get to talk all of the career of this gentleman. Uh, We get to talk about, of course, a lot about Hamilton, but we even get into some uh, advice for people that are looking to pursue musical theater. It's just a wonderful interview and we can't thank him enough. But let me tell you a bit about Julius Thomas III. He is an NAACP Theater Award nominated actor from Gary, Indiana, so really close to home here. He currently stars as Alexander Hamilton in the cultural phenom Hamilton. He is a Broadway veteran, having appeared in the original companies of the Scottsboro Boys, Porgy and Bess, and he was the lead in the smash hit Motown the Musical. He's traveled the country with Broadway national tours of the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, Xanadu, DreamWorks Shrek the Musical, Motown the Musical, Hamilton, and the Radio City Christmas Spectacular featuring the world famous Rockettes. You've seen Julius on TV as well. He's appeared on Modern Family, Odd Mom Out, GMA, The Capital Force Celebration, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, Live with Kelly and Michael, The Wendy Williams Show, Good Day LA, Midday Live, and more. He's featured vocalist on many recordings and recorded one of the greatest songs ever written, My Girl, under the Motown label. But Julius is most proud of his song that he sings for inspiration, I Am Here, available on iTunes with proceeds benefiting Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. We actually talk about that in the interview. It's wonderful. I really encourage you to go out and buy that song. Julius splits his time between New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and touring gigs, and as one half of the acclaimed King of Soul and Swing. He is currently working on a debut album to be released in 2021. Julius is a huge fan of music, and he credits his love for writing music to his time as a choir director and his tutelage under mega media mogul Barry Gordy. A shocker through and through, Julius is extremely proud of his training that he received at Wichita State University. He is an honors graduate from the School of Fine Arts, having received a BFA with a concentration in musical theater. And as often as he can, he tries to represent his school with honor. Go shocks. I will tell you what, just a fantastic conversation. Uh, I was so glad uh, to be part of it. And I think we're just going to dive right into it. So here we are, our conversation with Julius Thomas III. Well, welcome to the Beyond the Mouse podcast, the Community Voices partner of NPR Illinois, uh, to Julius Thomas III. How are you doing today, sir? I am so good and so excited to be here today. We're so excited to have you. And we uh, just went through the entire litany of so much talent that you have uh, and (laughs) So many opportunities you've had in your career. I can't wait to talk about a lot of things with you. And of course, we're going to mention a lot about Hamilton. But we also want to talk to you about the rest of your career, too. And actually, we are going to start off with a couple of Hamilton questions, if that's okay. And we're going to let that's Vanessa great. start us off. Well, you know, we want to talk about Hamilton. And how do you join something like Hamilton? You know, what was that process like? To say it's a, a worldwide phenomenon is probably an understatement at this point. So, you know, how was it getting that call and and having the opportunity to join the cast? And and just tell us more about getting into Hamilton. Yeah. How much time do you have? Okay. (laughs) Um, Whatever you want. (laughs) All right, great. Uh, Because there, there are several fun stories that I have, but I'll start with the audition process. It was, it was, um, it's been one of the, it was one of the most 
tough and rigorous processes that I've ever been through. I auditioned for almost every male character in the show. I probably went into the audition room about 15 times, which is really, really crazy and really strange. But having done the show now, I understand why it is that they put you through such a rigorous um, process because the show just demands so much of you. So I went in, uh, my first audition was to replace D David Diggs in the original company. He played Lafayette Jefferson. And um, I went in for that. I actually sent in a video for that, which was still floating around on the internet. I found a couple of days ago, I, was, I had to call my representation and say, can you please pull that video down? <laughs> um, but I sent in a video for that and they were like, okay, cool. Come into New York. I was out on tour at the moment. Come to New York as soon as you can and um, we'll see you for that. And that one didn't work out for me and it's probably good that it didn't. And then I had several other, you know, they tried to fit me in. And then finally we got down to Hamilton and I actually declined the invitation to come in to be seen for the role of Hamilton because I just thought to myself, no, that's not me. I, um, I'm more of a burr. I know I'm a burr. That's, I'm a sweet, soft singer. You know, that's the, the role that I'm dying to play. And uh, I, I originally said no, and everybody called me up and they were like, what are you doing? When Hamilton says you come in for Hamilton, you come in for Hamilton. I said, all right, fine, but they have to see me again for Aaron Burr. As long as they'll see me again for Aaron Burr, who do I think I am? Um, <laughs> and they saw me and they ended up offering me the role. And I was initially supposed to go out to one of the companies and, um, play uh, understudy Hamilton and Burr and the King, and then eventually go out to another company and play Burr for a year. But partway through there, they decided, no, we think you're a Hamilton, so we would love for you to go out to this other company and play Hamilton, so. You wow, know, that kind of so attitude cool. though, that, that almost is kind of like a, a Hamilton attitude where you're like, you know what? I, I don't know if that's exactly right for me, but I want this, you know, that, that almost shows that maybe you were right for Hamilton all along. Yeah, you know what? I ended up connecting more to Hamilton than I ever did to Burr. I only got to play Burr about four times, and even in rehearsals and things, I found it really tough to figure out that character, but something about Hamilton just really clicked for me. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. I think that, that I couldn't see it in myself, but the, thankfully the creative team saw it in me. So, And I also have a question about learning the score. This has just been on my mind since I first listened to that soundtrack. I, I know as an actor, as a, as a musical actor, I know you guys get the musical scores and you can, you know, read the sheet music and, and figure out, you know, your part. But with the rapping and like the stylistic way, I mean, that's really hard to put on paper. Did you just have to go back and listen to the cast recordings until you picked it up? Or, or did you have the score and you just decided to make it your own? Like, what's that process like? Uh, very interesting. See, so I didn't, I'm one of the weirdos that didn't listen to Hamilton before I auditioned for it, uh, or until I was offered the, audition, the opportunity to audition for it. I like to see a show and be totally surprised by what's going on. So whereas everybody else had listened to it over and over and over again and had it memorized and all that good stuff, um, by the time I auditioned for it, I had only listened to it once because I just wanted to get a feel for it. And then I wanted to go in and do my thing. And then I kind of kept that idea. So when I actually got cast, Everybody in the room knew the score already, but I had to sit down with the uh, accompanist and actually have him plunk out almost every single thing for me. We started our first day of rehearsal, and I don't know if you guys remember the very iconic verse, first couple of uh, notes is bum, 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 bum. And then, you know, everybody around me just sort of like launched into knowing their parts, and I was sitting there going, oh no. <laughs> did, did they already have rehearsal without me because I don't know this stuff yet so it was it was a very long journey of me just sort of sitting down with what the accompanist sort of plunked out for me and taught me but um, once I got into figuring it out it, I likened it to tap because I'm a tapper mm. and sort of the same rhythmic um, we use like deep, a dee dot, 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 a dee dot, a dee dee dot, you know, uh, to kind of figure out how we're doing our sounds with our feet. And that was sort of 
um, just sort of the avenue that I use to figure out how to learn these rhythms for the rap. And because I'm not a rapper, I'm a singer, but now I'm a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say you are now. <laughs> You provided such a perfect segue into Brett's first question. Uh, yeah. you, you, you don't even know. Uh, Brett, you wanted to, to mention that you have a confession to make, right? Yes, I, I have a confession. I haven't seen Hamilton yet. Okay. I've wanted to see it. I've had plans to see it. I had plans to see it in St. Louis at the Fox, like right now, but that isn't happening. And I've done the Hamilton Lottery in Los Angeles and Chicago and St. Louis. And I did see Hamilton on the Tony Awards. But mm -hmm. I wanted to have a very pure experience because so many people had, they, they say such wonderful things. I wanted to have a pure experience. So this Friday, uh, Hamilton is going to be on Disney Plus and it will be yeah. my first experience. So... So since we're talking about Hamilton and your experience, and we are beyond the mouse, we have to talk about Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. Are you throwing a watch yeah. party? Or what do you think <laughs> about a filmed version will be like? What do you think a filmed version will be like? Well, I hadn't thought about throwing a watch party yet, but maybe I'll do like a social distance Zoom with my friends or something to, that <laughs> to would that be effect. Cool. Something like what we're doing today. Hey, maybe we can all get up, get together. Hey, I'm available. Perfect. We're available. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm really excited for you, Brett, because um, you're going to get to see the original intent for the roles. One of the wonderful things that I really love about the experience that I've had with Hamilton as an actor is that no one ever asked me to be Lin-Manuel Miranda. They never came to me and said, hey, do this thing the way that you hear it on the recording, or here's a clip of Lin-Manuel Miranda doing X, Y, and Z. Could you just do this? They pretty much have left me to my own devices to figure out my character, and then they tweak me as we go. So it's Julius's interpretation of Hamilton as opposed to Julius's interpretation of Lin-Manuel Miranda doing Hamilton, which is a hat on a hat on a hat and just sort of loses a lot of, you know, the original intent. So I really love that each Hamilton company is its own experience, but your first experience with the show is going to be with the original intent for the roles. And so I'm really excited about that for you. And then once you get the opportunity to see Hamilton, you know, once we're back in the theaters, you should also come and see a live production of it because it just is, it's a different, it's a completely different animal with different characters. My show changes all the time, depending on who I'm playing against. And, you know, because the show is so tough, you know, you might have a different sister on Wednesday and then a different Burr on Friday. And so it just really continues to make the show new and interesting. Yes. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to see it in Chicago, and I almost went in with the thought, uh, almost worried that I had memorized the soundtrack and listened to it over and over and over again. What was that going to do for the experience of actually seeing it? And then you see things like, and, and also, I thought it was um, interesting that it won the Tony for Best Choreography that year, because I thought, I'm listening to this, where's the choreography in this? But the whole show is so beautifully choreographed. I mean, it's just so, so incredible um, through and through. But you mentioned uh, Lynn Manuel, and he recently gave an interview where he said uh, about Hamilton coming to Disney Plus that in the Obama era, some felt that the show was hopeful. And in the Trump era, some have felt that it's defiant. And in the moment right now, what we're seeing is the language of revolution everywhere. And so that language of revolution present in the show from 244 years ago is being felt again in a way by the black and brown future of this country, reckoning with what the future of this country is going to be going forward. Um, so that's quite the quote, but I wanted to get your thoughts on what you feel Hamilton means now. Oh, it's such a big question. Um, well, I'll just start with the, my thesis on that subject, which is rep representation matters. This is the first time, <clears throat> no, I won't, I won't say that. This is one of the only times where I've been handed a character that is fully thought out, that is fully fleshed out, that has a beginning, a middle, an end, a backstory, uh, a continuing on story, um, where 
I didn't need anything except for what was on the page. You know, I could go read history book after history book. I, I have plenty of things to draw from, but I just never needed a bunch of outside stuff because the role is so well written. So I really loved seeing the show because here are all these fantastically beautiful black, brown, lighter skinned um, folks who are fully fleshed out characters and really getting to sit in their abilities and their skills. And it, it's a show that's worthy of their talents. So first of all, it's representation, seeing yourself up on the stage represented in a way that is beautiful and whole and complete. Um, but also, and I find that quote really interesting because I had never thought about it that way, but when, when we're doing the show, when we've been doing the show over the past year, everything that's happening in the news you come to the show and something in our show resonates with something that's happening. We have a, sh a line in the show that is about quid pro quo. And before all of the quid pro quo Trump stuff happened, that line never got a reaction. But mm -hmm. as it was happening and after it was happening, it brought new meaning to what we were doing in the show. And it just sort of says that the, the show is a bit ahead of its time or at least speaks to issues that we are still dealing with um, today. Um, so I find it both prosthetic, I also find it wholly flushed out, and um, it, it's definitely something that is needed today, and it was needed for me because I was starting to lose a little bit of faith in trying to be a leading man in a, in a business that doesn't necessarily celebrate who I am and what I can do. So I love Hamilton. I love it. <laughs> Right, you have a question about uh, one of his other roles. Yes, well, I mean, you have, you've had a wonderful career so far and you keep going. But my question is, I mean, well, Gershwin's Porgy and Best ran on Broadway in 2011 and 2012 and won the mm -hmm. Tony Award for Best Revival of a Musical. Okay, so as a performer, how do you take care of yourself vocally singing opera on a Broadway performance schedule? Oh my goodness. Well, I will, I will tell you that I was a swing on that show. So I was fortunate enough to not have to be on every night, but I did find that quite a bit of a challenge because I'm raised on gospel. I'm raised on r and I'm raised on, and then when I went away to school and started studying musical theater, I became raised on uh, or uh, acclimated to either pop musical theater or contemporary musical theater. So opera is not my, <clears throat> it's not my bag. I've trained classically and I've trained on songs that are um, considered art songs, but never anything as tough as Porgy and Bess. And it really came down to getting into uh, a different kind of shape. I went into my voice teacher and I said, here's the sound that I'm trying to create. Here's the, the show that I'm a part of. Um, what tricks and what things can we do to make me, you know, make my instrument, which is not trained in this thing, be able to produce this type of sound while also being healthy. And so it became an everyday thing of me warming up in a different way of, of singing in a different placement and, and you know, uh, interacting with my instrument in a different way. It was, it was a really tough challenge and that's a really tough question. So thank I'm you for sorry. asking. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> It's just yeah. amazing. Well, and, I, and um, I've got to ask, just because I'm a huge Audra McDonald fan, what is it like to be in her presence? I, I, mean, I mean, you know, sharing the stage yeah. with her. Is she, is, you know, is, is she as wonderful as I expect she is? <laughs> Audra McDonald is, I took a lot of lessons from her. She's one of the most giving leading ladies that I've ever experienced. I, as a swing, um, was put into ensemble tracks and, and um, I would step out and sing my little solos and things of that nature. But through most of the scenes dealing with Audra or Bess, um, I didn't have very much of a, a role to play. Those were, you know, leading character scenes, but I was in them. And she always found a moment to make eye contact with me or to fully um, involve me in her world. Uh, which was a lot of fun to be this like character who had this sort of secret moment with the lead, had this sort of um, these, this eye-catching moment with uh, this beautiful leading lady, this Bess. Um, so I, I appreciated that. But beyond that, she's just a normal gal who is, who is 
performing eight times a week in a really hard role and she oh you know she worked hard and you saw her struggle at times and I really appreciated that because I struggle quite often playing Hamilton I've struggled in lots of other shows it's it's real that eight shows a week is really tough and to see it happen to someone who is so good at their craft and so trained and so um, in tune with their instrument was um, affirming and uh, let me know that I was on the right path and in the right place. She's human and she's amazing. <laughs> Boy, yes. <laughs> well, I actually have a question about um, another show you've done, which is Motown the Musical. So good. Mm, yeah. um, and I think I saw in an interview that you said that you actually got the chance to perform as Barry Gordy in front of Barry Gordy or with him in the audience. You know, what was that like? He's, he's, he's the guy behind Motown. You know, that's got, that's got to be an incredible experience. Yes. <laughs> so, um, oddly enough, I spent probably around four years very close, like being able to reach out and touch Barry Gordy, which was something that I really had to, you know, <laughs> sort of wrap my brain around. Here, here I am with this man who literally changed the face of the music industry and, you know, produced the soundtrack of so many people's lives. I mean, every generation reintroduces the next to Motown music in some way or another. You know, they may change, tweak the beat behind it. They may you know, put a different voice on it, but the, the music of Motown has lasted since the 60s and I think it will be with us forever. And how crazy is that to be in the same room with a person who, you know, you know birthed <laughs> all of that stuff and to have him look at me and go, hey, I want you to tell my story. Um, it's a huge thing to put on your shoulders and kind of run with, but I, I took it on and he was, really wonderful and and anytime i had a question about things that happened back in the day he's still sharp as a tack even at 80 something years old he remembered all of it he was very willing to share all of those things and likewise to not be afraid to treat me like an actor and to say julius this is a moment that isn't working how do we fix it or here's how i think we can fix it and allow me to go bg i think that um if we do X, Y, and Z, this will be the sort of the thing that makes this, this number go over well. Or, or, you know, he was very willing to collaborate and very willing to hear what I had to say while also not being afraid to just sort of like get in there and be hands on. So yeah, another great. Did, did I just hear you say BG? Is that like, is that what, what you call wow. him? Is BG? <laughs> yeah. That is so cool. Like you're oh on gosh. a nickname basis. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we, we either got to call him BG or the chairman or Mr. Gordy. I, I, oh, I went wow. with BG because, you know, I'm JT3. So BG and JT3, we just seem like two peas in a pod. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, did you have a follow-up to that question? Yeah, well, Mr. Gordy really allowed audiences to see into his world, the good and, you know, the not so good, and the world that he created. So, I mean, you really take on challenging roles. What is that like to be, you know, Mr. Gordy? I mean, you yeah. talked about that a little bit, but you take on such challenging roles. You know, it, is, it, is, it, is that what you're drawn to or is that what's just offered or combination? You know, the chips fall where they may. I, I definitely go out for things that I think are right for me and are something that I can do well because, you know, you're only as good as your last gig or your last interview or, you know, and I want to make sure that I'm not just choosing pro projects uh, for a monetary value, even though that helps. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I choose roles that I think I can relate to and um, that I can put my own spin on or my honesty on and not have to play a character so much as inhabit a person. And it is a, it is a very different thing to play a fictional character than it is to play someone who is real and very much alive and very much involved in the process. You know, playing Alexander Hamilton, he's not going to come up and tell me how much he hates my uh, rendition of who he is. But Barry Gordy could have, um, and so could some of the other characters that I've played. And it, it, there isn't as much, um, I've also played Donkey in Shrek on the, you know, the first national tour and things of that nature. There's a lot less pressure behind that, but 
it still carries its own weight. And those are fun things. And Barry Gordy was fun, but also hard in its own way. So I, I love to be challenged all over the place. I want to do comedy. I want to do drama. I want to do television. I want to do film. I love the theater. It's been very kind home to me. I don't want to sit still and I don't want to get complacent. Mm -hmm. Too early for that. Oh, yes. Very early. So. I'm going to go off script a little bit from our questions because you mentioned that you're a tapper and I, I actually uh, found a demo video uh, of you about 10 years ago uh, and you were in Xanadu and just tapping like a madman oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> on a table and my wife's a tapper. Uh, I've, I've tried. I've been in those community theater productions where they need a couple <laughs> of guys to, to shuffle a, a little bit in the background, but um, can you talk to me about how, uh, how tapping uh came about like it was that something that you were just passionate about while from a young age or uh how is that experience molded into the musical theater side as well yeah so i actually started all forms of dance including tap um very late in life i started at about 20. um oh. i was in college and i was actually on a full scholarship for biology and i was going to be a physical therapist and go do maybe be a singing physical therapist and do all kinds of interesting things in the medical field. But you know, that, that did not turn out to be my lot. But um, I had always wanted to learn some, some dance and I got involved in the Orcasis dance group at my first college, which was the University of Northern Iowa. And tap was sort of the first thing that I grabbed onto. I liked ballet, but unless you've been studying ballet from very early on, it's really hard to make your facility, your body do what is needed to become very good at it or become professional at it. But tap was something that I could excel at, um, even in my old age of 20, um, starting to learn how to dance. Uh, that's, that's basically ancient if you're starting to learn how to dance. But um, it was the first thing that I sort of latched onto that let me know that, I, oh, I can, this is something that I could do and actually be pretty decent at. So uh, it's my first love and I haven't done it for a while, especially in a show, um, but maybe one day again, we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just fantastic. <laughs> Going back uh, to talk about Hamilton and, and about those roles that are challenging, you were part of the Puerto Rico run of Hamilton and uh, that, that show had a lot of weight on it. You know, the, the island had just been ravished by Hurricane Maria and this show uh, really raised funds to help in that relief effort. And so I wanted you to talk to talk about that experience and, and also your, your understudy, uh, you're being the understudy to the person that developed not only the character, but also the entire concept of Hamilton. So does that place any kind of additional pressures on you while you're performing? Or uh, what was that experience like in general? Yeah, Puerto Rico was magical. Uh, we went to the island and, you know, uh, Lin-Manuel and his father have uh, ties. I believe that um, Luis, Manuel, um, Luis Miranda is from there. Um, and so they've always had these like strong ties to their home, which makes sense. So when we got the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico, first of all, I was really thrilled because it meant a vacation for me. Um, but, but also uh, because I knew that we were going to go and do something that was really going to help reinvigorate the island. Just to sort of say the island is open again for tourism, that really wonderful things are happening here, that you can come and have a vacation here and see a great show and eat some really amazing food and, you know, just experience what the island has to offer and to help <clears throat> something to that effect so don't quote me on that it might even be five and i don't want to um it's been a while since i've <laughs> since i've thought about what it was that we but uh, millions, of dollars. Millions, <laughs> millions of dollars millions and millions of dollars, dollars. that yeah. is the point um <laughs> that people people paid you know top dollar to show up and see lin-manuel miranda step back into the show and to you know witness this sort of like moment in history um this rising star sort of stepping back in and and taking over again and it was cool for me too because at that point i had been doing the show for uh, i don't know maybe like 10 months so my hamilton was complete but not complete so um 
I still had to take over and get together with the, this new company and um, sort of us put our stamp on it together. But I had already sort of decided who the basics of my Hamilton was and it was really wonderful to just see Lin-Manuel do it again and go, oh, okay, all right, now I remember why it was done this way because this is the original intent, you know? So it was sort of a rediscovering of the role for me too. And there's something that really interesting that happens. I've had the opportunity to do this, especially with Barry Gordy, um, to step away from it for a while and to go live a different life and then come back to it because you're changed. You're a completely different person and how you feel about each moment in the show sort of shifts. It changes how you play the role. So um, it was wonderful to watch him to get a break from doing it and then to step back into it to say, okay, now I've got some new perspectives on, on what this guy can be. Yeah, and Absolutely. with those new perspectives, um, and you mentioned this earlier, how you thought you were more of an Aaron Burr, but now uh, you've you've taken on Hamilton. You know, having played them uh, both, are you finding that you prefer one role over the other? Yeah, I'm definitely all in for Hamilton now. All in. <laughs> I mean, I still love Aaron Burr. There are just, you know, in, in choosing roles, we think we might be right for a thing. And then in practical application, you get in there and you're like, oh, this is kind of a miscast. Um, so whereas I feel like Burr suits me vocally, I believe that Hamilton suits me more as an actor. And um, I miss singing, you know, Hamilton doesn't really sing very much. You know, I try to throw in a few notes here and there will they, while, where they will let me. Right. Um, but most of the time they're like, Julia's too much singing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, th that's interesting because when we were listening uh, to videos of you, uh, we were like, wow, he's, he's a really great singer. And I was like, yes. I wonder if we're going to hear that or if we'd be able to hear that as you playing Hamilton because it you're right it, I can't recall any moment where he's just full-on belting or singing a song but um, I'm glad we at least got to see those videos of you singing them. <laughs> yeah 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 we no, didn't I mean, know if oh go ahead I'm sorry no no I no we didn't know if you were a rangy baritone or a tenor of ultimate range or what where do you kind of put yourself you sing what it's you need to it, I sing what I need to. It's been a debate for many years. Um, <laughs> I always, I always try to say that I'm a baritone with pop-up notes because that means that I get to sing the middle line, which is a lot easier than singing tenor all the time. But anybody who hears me sing usually is like, "You are a tenor. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> sing the tenor part. Stop being lazy." <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, you know, one of my favorites uh, in the show, and you know, you've, you've, there's so many, there's what, 44, 45 tracks or something like that. Um, but You'll Be Back is definitely one of those. It's just a, a favorite. You've also uh, gotten to play the king as well. Uh, so it, we, we have to ask, you know, what's your favorite, is there a favorite song that you have that you've performed or a favorite uh, lyric from a song that you just love uh, and you've really related to? What, what's your favorites from the show? Well, I'm going to answer that in a question, that question in a second. But first, okay. let me just talk about the king for a second. That role is boss. If I could play, <laughs> if, you know, after I'm done playing Hamilton, if I could go sit up in somebody's company somewhere and play the king for the rest of my life, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> because it's about 15 to 20 minutes of being on stage come out as the king three times, and then you um, eventually come out as an ensemble member without all of your king gear. And most people don't even notice that you've come out. You know, you're doing lots of um, work up on the surround, and I uh, know you haven't seen it yet, Brett, but that will make sense. That's okay. <laughs> no spoilers. I'm like, uh, going, I... <laughs> there's a rafter that sort of like goes all the way around the stage, and we call that the surround. Um, and so you do a little bit of work up there, but then after the show is over, you go outside and you meet the fans and they go, you were my favorite part. <laughs> and they would, they would say that to the king as I'm standing right next to him going, I was just on stage for two hours and 47 minutes. He was on stage for 15 minutes. How is he your favorite part? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just sort of set up for, you know, the king to, to succeed. So I would be happy to go play the king anywhere. <laughs> now, I forgot your question now that I've done with my rant. Favorite you ask song, favorite oh, yeah. lyric, favorite anything, favorite If you want to sing any of it, by the way, you can. <laughs> we, won't, we won't be upset. <laughs> well, I wish I could see some Hamilton for you today, but of course I'm still under contract and they will oh, okay. come after me and get me. So Fair enough. Fair I enough. won't do any I won't That's do any Hamilton okay. for you today. But I will mm -hmm. say that my favorite it was in my brain already. It's Quiet Uptown is uh um, Oh right. Yes. Yeah, okay. is the reason I love the song, I'll just tell you that, is because yeah. um he's at his very lowest. He's uh, in trouble with the law and basically his career seems like it's about to be over because he's had this affair and he's lost his son and he just it's this moment of absolute and utter like rock bottom um, and so I love that song because of that moment I don't know I just love a redemption story so <laughs> absolutely Brett, uh, you wanted to actually talk a little bit about Christmas. Well, yes. Well, you were featured in Carols for the Cure, volume 16, in the song, I Am Here. Yeah. What a great message. So yeah. powerful. I, um, anyway, what was that experience like and what's special about singing that song? Yes, so um, back when I was in the Broadway company of Motown, our leading lady, Valicia Lacay, who uh, was playing Diana Ross at the time, uh, was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And we were all sort of rocked by it because it was very early on in the show's uh, life. And she needed to take a break and just sort of focus on her health and things of that nature. And one day we just got together as a cast and we decided that we were going to have a day of prayer. Um, you know, we, we did a, a sort of a phone like a Zoom, a phone uh, tree situation where we just got together and we said some prayers for our company member. And then we were going to have a day of, of sort of like just reflecting and fasting and just sending all of her, our energy and prayers up for her. And while in that moment, uh, a song came to my mind, I write and just mostly for my own self-expression, I write music, uh, but a song came to my heart and I decided after that moment of prayer and reflection to just write it down and to reach out to my cast to see if they might want to, you know, sing it with me, to send to her as a moment of inspiration. And we did it, we put it on YouTube and it touched so many people and it went so much further than I ever expected. And then it was the, the folks over at Carol's for a Cure, which is my favorite charity, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS, um, decided that they wanted to include it in that year's songs for Christmas and inspiration and things of that nature. So we got to go into the, re the recording studio and record my first song professionally. So I was oh, wow. very thrilled about that. That is that. Well, I don't, I downloaded my copy from iTunes. It's, as I said, such a powerful and, inspir and inspiring song, but especially right now, and yeah. it's part of Carols for the Cure, and we need a little Christmas inspiration right this very minute. So it, yes. it, even though it's almost Christmas in July, but um, it, I listened to it and I, it's, I loved it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning it. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's a song of inspiration, so it doesn't just have to be for Christmas. No, and folks, not if, at all. You, if you get the song, every dime goes to help those in need right now. Um, Broadway Cares Equity Fights A's is a charity that gives to over 500 other organizations, including the Phyllis Newman Women's Health Initiative, um, dealing with folks with cancer and you know, providing meals and medication for folks, not just with AIDS, but with all different kinds of um, life struggles. So it's $1.99, I think, or $1.29 or something to that effect, and it will help so many people. So please go pick it up on iTunes. And plus, it's just some amazing singers. <laughs> oh, it's great. It was, it was wonderful. I was so good. It was so great to hear about it. And now it's a favorite. So thank you. Thank you. Well, Vanessa, you wanted to talk about yeah. uh, Soul and Swing? Yeah, well, speaking of your music career as well, um, you're part of a, a group with a tremendous sound. I just love how full it sounds with all the instrumentation. It's the, the Kings of Soul and Swing, and it features you and uh, a crooner, Mark, uh, I hope I'm saying this right, Kapitsky. 
You did. And, nice okay, job. great. And I was just wondering, I mean, that is that is a throwback to an older sound. It, you guys truly sound phenomenal. Um, how did you two meet? How did this group come to be? Yeah, so the Kings of Soul and Swing is a project that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, a few years back, right after the, I was on the tour of Motown, I toured the country, played um, LA for several months, and then, you know, on and on and on and on. But I decided after that tour, after I left, to move to LA and sort of give television and film a bit of a run and just sort of wet my, wet my feet and just see what, if anything, I could um, make happen in LA. And while I was there, I was missing singing. So I auditioned for a gig band. And in that gig band, I met a cat named Mark Kapitsky and he showed up in a bow tie and suspenders and got up and sang all of the crooner stuff, the Frank Sinatra, the Buble, he's a brilliant singer. And one day I just said to him, I said, man, I would really love to make some music with you. What do you think about coming up with a couple of shows that we might be able to, you know, tour the country with, or maybe go out on a cruise ship with, or, you know, just, just something of our own. You know, I would really love to make some music with you. And he was instantly down for it. We started writing that very same day. And um, about three years later now, we've got this group that tours the country and plays all kinds of fun gigs and gets to sing the kind of music that we want to sing and put our own little spin on it. And yeah, you just, if you get the opportunity, check out the Kings of Soul and Swing. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, we will. I did. Sure. Her. You're great. Oh my gosh. Thank <laughs> you. Thank Ready you. for that national tour? Let's come. Yes, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I put this in there. Vanessa uh, works at an art center. She, you know, we could we could make this happen sometime. So. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, truly, you you have so many talents and so many credits to your name. Um, Thank you. Do you have a a performance or a piece that you're most proud of? Uh, and so what, what kind of stands out in your mind as, as something that you're just really proud of looking back on? Yeah, each piece has ha had its own significance. You know, Porgy and Bess was important because it was my second Broadway show. And the second Broadway show is almost more important than the first because it lets you know the first wasn't a fluke. Um, but my first Broadway show was a show called The Scottsboro Boys. And if you don't know the story of the Scottsboro Boys, it's about nine African-American men in the 1920s who were wrongfully accused um, by two ladies of doing some really heinous things and, and just sort of their lives in the nine trials, the nine farcical trials that were put on in that time to, uh, it's just one of the linchpin moments of the civil rights movement. And it was the final show of the legendary team John Kander and Fred Ebb, and you know John Kander and Ebb from musicals like Chicago and Cabaret and the song New York, New York. Um, Fred Ebb uh, left us a while ago, but John Kander is still with us and this is the last show that they collaborated on. So it was really wonderful to be a part of something historic and something the last of something, the last of an era as well as to sort of create some, have this like perfect melding of art and commercialism because that, that show was, it ruffled feathers, it was polarizing. It was either you were angry and you couldn't sit through it or you got to the end of it and you couldn't move from your seat because you were so rocked by what was going on. So it was really wonderful to be a part, my first Broadway show to be this like lovely melding of art and commercialism. It did not do well. It only lasted about six weeks on Broadway, but we had sold out runs at both, both our off Broadway run and our out of town tryout, which was at the Guthrie in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is a huge regional theater. Big theater so, town. <laughs> big theater town. Minneapolis is one of the smartest theater towns I've ever been a part of. Right alongside my hometown of Chicago. Well, Gary, Indiana, but yeah. you know, I, started, I started my career in Chicago. Yay, Midwesterners. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so we are all involved really heavily in the local community theater scene. And so we probably have a lot of our performer friends listening in on this and just wanted to see if you have any words of wisdom or advice for anybody that uh, likes to do that just as a hobby or even people that are considering, you know, we have a lot of 
high schoolers that are looking to go into college programs and, and going to make a run at this professionally. And so just wanted to see if you had advice or words of wisdom for them. Uh, my first uh, bit of advice would be, let no be fuel for the fire. Um, no is a word that we're going to, we hear a lot in this business and you, you might hear it in, in many businesses, but the amount of times that we put ourselves out in front of a, a, other people to be judged and to say, please take me, take me and, and put me in your show is, um, astronomical. I've probably done thousands of auditions at this point in my career. And the amount of times that I've heard no um, could have been a thing that rocked me and, and kept me from getting to my Hamilton. But because I, I heard no and what I heard was not right for this project or not right now instead of no, it just sent me back to the drawing board and, and made me go, okay, I didn't book Hamilton this time. Why was that? Was that because of something I could have done better in the room? Is it something that I could have tweaked? Is it because I didn't know my material well enough? Um, I use that no as fuel to go, what is it about my career? What is it about me that needs to be tweaked? And how can I walk into the room and be even better the next time? So if you, if you allow no to be fuel to the fire instead of no to be a frustrating and sort of detrimental thing, it will propel you into the thing that is actually right for you. And that brings me to my next point, which is not everything is right for you. Um, you may love Frozen. You may be obsessed with Elsa. You may love Let It Go like crazy. And I just use Disney as an example because we're beyond the mouse right now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you may love all of those things and they may be really important and special to you, but that may not be your gig. Um, your gig may be something else. And just just because that thing is in your gig doesn't mean you can't continue to enjoy it, but there is something out there that is right for you and take the time to find that thing instead of focusing on the thing that may not be right, may not be your gig. So those are my little tidbits of wisdom <laughs> for whatever they're, they're great. Oh my gosh. That's, they're yeah. worth a ton. <laughs> yes. for sure. So thank you for that. Uh, Vanessa, you had a question. Yeah, well, Hamilton, the musical, it is uh, premiering on Disney plus uh, on July 3rd. And mm -hmm. as theater goers um, and our friends who are theater goers, you know, um, it seems that we are all so starved for theater at the moment. We've, we've never gone this long without going to a show. And I think it will be a really cathartic experience for a lot of people to watch um, Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. So I just wondered, how do you feel about how the arts has really helped people in a virtual way um, in this time of uncertainty? Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because the arts are always the first thing to go whenever anyone is talking about slashing a budget or needing to save money or anything like that. But has it, isn't it interesting that right now everyone is consuming the arts like their lives depend on it? I mean, where, where would be, we be right now without all of our shows to binge watch and our music to listen to to calm us down? and our recordings of Hamilton and, and other kinds of things to sort of satiate us in a time where we literally shouldn't be going outside of our doors. Um, isn't it funny that art is now essential? Even though we don't say it's essential, it's sort of a thing that everyone is consuming rapidly right now. So um, it's sort of a fun jab in the, in the side to those people who are like, <laughs> uh, we should cut arts funding, but... <laughs> But um, at the same time, I don't even know that they're noticing that they're consuming it at a higher rate. Um, <laughs> right. So we just have to continue on and just believe and know that the work that we're doing is important and that, you know, every time I step out on stage that someone is being changed. And if not, that they're at least being entertained for a few hours and giving in an escape. Um, so that's, that's what I like to say about art in a time where we need it. Yeah, and we so appreciate you as well taking the time to do even this interview because I know, like like Craig said, we're going to be sharing this with our uh, community theater, which is very and a very large active group. And I know they're just gonna they're gonna go gaga for this. This you know yeah. they're they're so gonna be so excited. But um, I also just wanted to say 
that I was planning a trip to San Francisco for the summer 2020, and my brother has oh. not seen Hamilton, and I was hoping <laughs> to take him to see Hamilton, and then when we found out you were the guy, my mind exploded. So <laughs> thank you for bringing Hamilton to me, even though I couldn't come to you. But um, to my question, you know, we've had a lot of um, guests on recently who have, who have really surprised us in, in how um, they are continuing to, um, you know, take on, or think of projects and develop things while they are in quarantine. Um, and I, so I was just wondering, you know, how are you staying busy? And I, and I think, you know, you have an album coming out in 2021. Is, is that something you're, you know, gearing up for as well? Yeah, so many, you know, I've been very fortunate in that I, I have not had a lot of downtime in my life. Um, this is the longest I've ever gone without working. Uh, since I graduated from college, I've pretty much had a job the entire time, which is very much unheard of for a theater performer. So as much as I am missing my gig at Hamilton and as much as I am sad that I can't perform, it's been really wonderful to sort of pick up those projects and go, I used to say if I had the time to do this thing, I would do it. And now that I have the time, I'm actually doing it, <laughs> which, is, um, which is great. It's, it doesn't just mean that I'm lazy. It means that like I actually didn't have time to sit down. But I, you know, I've got, I've, I'm working on an album, you know, something along the lines of an EP and maybe four, four or five songs, just something for my own self-expression. I've always been really nervous about putting out my own music and really nervous about putting my voice on, um, on recordings, I don't listen to myself or watch myself very often, as many actors uh, don't, because it's just so weird. Well, to... you're good. Well, you're you really should. Well, I appreciate you that. We should look at more. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm, I've, I've sat down and I've started to write a book, and um, I've also been writing a script, and I am working on some digital ideas for uh, social media, both for the Kings of Soul and Swing and for my own personal page, and just sort of having the time to set up my camera and do those things has been really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And also I miss my job. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, at the we same time. Definitely, we look forward to seeing all those things come to fruition as I'm, I'm sure they will. Yeah, just, I mean, for all of the listeners, please come follow along at Julius Thomas 3. I promise to, you know, inundate you with fun singing videos and all kinds of things like that. And then every once in a while, you'll see some of the more scripted and, and um, produced things that I'm working on in the future. Ooh, I, plus did, lots of fun I your, love that plus invitation. Plus lots of Hamilton stuff. Plus lots of Hamilton yeah. stuff. So there you go. Hey. I creeped on your Instagram a little bit. And I'll tell you, you went <laughs> to the place that I would say is maybe one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, Arches National Park. Oh my goodness, it's my so mind was blown. incredible. It's so funny, um, we, uh, when we went there, uh, there's a sign, I think, to um, one of the, the more famous arches that says it's like 1.1 mile. And I'm like, oh, that's no problem. I can do 1.1 mile. It's like yeah. straight up a mountain, you know? <laughs> it's like, this is so great, but it is such a beautiful place. So uh, just thank you so much for, for coming on and talking to us today. You know, my, my son was born in 2015, and I was in the middle of Hamilton fever at the time, and uh, just walking around with him and, and singing to him probably poorly, much, much more poorly than you do, uh, <laughs> Dear Theodosia. He has his own record uh, deal, don't be And those yeah, songs. you know, just, just um, that those songs mean so much to so many different people. And uh, it's, it's really great that uh, you're, you took some time out of your day to talk with us about that experience and just your whole career. It's just been, you have had such a stellar career and I can't wait to follow and see where you're going from here. It's just, uh, it's just wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And I hope that this won't be the last time that we will hang out together. Hopefully I can come back and chat with you guys about more fun projects in the future. And um, this has been a lot of fun for me too. Oh, great. great. We'll see you yes. Friday for the, for the premiere. <laughs> for our, yeah, for you, our, you our Zoom meetup. Did you know? Know? <laughs> I didn't forget <laughs> It's true, it's true. <laughs> yeah. But we thank you so much. Uh, and of course, you are welcome back anytime you'd like to come on. So thank you so much. Uh, and we really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. What an amazing conversation. We, I mean, as a theater nerd, we got to cover so many things that I have wanted to talk to 
uh, with someone that is a Broadway actor, you know, just a, a marvelous person. He is so kind uh, with his time and generous with his answers. Just thank you so much, Julius. We're going to talk a bit about uh, the interview now. Uh, Vanessa, what are your thoughts about the interview we just had? Oh, I had such a good time talking to Julius. You know, you can tell when he's um, giving his answers, he's very thoughtful in his response and just so just generous with his time and genuine. And I mean, I don't think we could have picked a nicer person to talk to. And it's so great to talk to Alexander Hamilton. We talked to him, guys. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Brett? So, as I'm not new to Hamilton, but I've been keeping myself pure by, I, the only thing I've seen is um, the Tony Awards and, uh, and, and whenever it's on Sirius XM, I turn it off because I want my Hamilton experience to be what everyone else has had. You know, this life-changing event. And now I'm gonna be watching it on Disney Plus, which premieres on July 3rd. I, I can't wait for it. And to talk to someone who is in the room where it happened. I know that much, you know, <laughs> anyway, so I'm like going, so he had so much to share and it was so kind of him to spend, uh, spend some time with us. It was fun, amazing. I would completely uh, recommend checking out uh, Julius on all of his social media channels. Uh, he mentioned them in the interview, but also I'm gonna go download I Am Here uh, this instance. It's uh, wonderful. So you can, it's that's, that's something perfect. very simple that you can do that not only supports him, but also supports uh, such a wonderful charitable effort. So go and, and buy that off of iTunes. I mean, that is that is the least we can do uh, to support him and support an amazing cause. So Yeah, um, and his voice is seriously so good. It's like, it's like butter. It's, it's mean, just so good. <laughs> that, that he wrote that song. And then I wrote that song. I'm like going, Oh my gosh, because it's gorgeous. And it right. just, it's, it's what we need. It's, it's very in inspiring and inspirational. Mm. So good. We, we have had such a, a remarkable time this past month talking to so many uh, unique and interesting individuals. If you are listening for the first time, uh, go back and listen to our previous episodes. We do have another episode uh, that will be coming out in the relatively near future where we interviewed Academy Award nominee director Leslie Iwerks. Uh, that was a fantastic interview as well. Uh, just amazing things here. And we are so grateful and so grateful to these guests for giving us a little bit of their time and for just really uh, giving us so much of their life experiences and talking about what makes them uh, an artist and it just it has been so phenomenal so thank you for that if you're new to the show welcome thank you so much for listening uh you can find us at nprillinois.org or you can find us on spotify apple Podcasts, any podcast app platform that you would like to you can just search for beyond the mouse we are also part of the front row network so make sure you head over to their social media channels of the front row network I will say that I've been doing a lot more on Instagram. So follow us on Instagram, Beyond the Mouse Pod. And if you can believe it, we have our own email address now. So you can email us at beyondthemousepod at gmail.com. Uh, I want you to tell me specifically, do you like the turkey leg or do you not like the turkey leg? Because that has been a debate that's been raging for so many months uh, and so many years, truly, on this podcast. And now you have a way to interact with us and tell us exactly what you think. You're just going to um, have again, an inbox full of turkey leg lovers. I know it. I know it. <laughs> oh, yes. But well, <laughs> again, thank you so much, Julius. Uh, if you're listening back to this, you are a remarkable individual. I can't wait to uh, follow your career. And I can't believe that someone that has performed to so many sellout houses uh, was willing to sit down and chat to us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank but that's you it. So for, much. Yeah, any any final thoughts? Well, just thank you so much, Julius. You've just been wonderful, and we will see you Friday for Hamilton on Disney Plus. You <laughs> yes. are going to hang out with us. That's what you said. No taxi backsies. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you again for the Beyond the Mouse podcast. This is Craig. 
I'm Vanessa. And I'm Brett. And we will see you real soon in the front row. Hopefully not singing all the Hamilton songs while you're watching all the Hamilton songs. Let, <laughs> let yourself experience Hamilton. it. And then go and sing later. Brett, I can't believe you haven't Love seen this it. show. It's so good, Brett. Brett, it's so good. It's so good.